Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Stephen Curry. And Stephen is going to talk to us about how to evaluate research and its impact, but in a responsible way. So the, the subject, and I'm sure you're all very deeply interested in, uh, and in this seminar, Professor Curry will share his thoughts on how we can overcome the many challenges associated with evaluating research, including things like why we evaluate research and why it's important, uh, why, why evaluating research is difficult, and, uh, and also how can we capture the impact of, of research. Professor Curry is Assistant Provost for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, and also Professor of Structural Biology at Imperial College London. His research and teaching have long combined with strong interests in the wider role that science plays in society. He's very active in public engagement, and he has keen interest in science policy, particularly in R&D funding, research evaluation, and in scholarly publication. Through his role in, uh, as international chair of the Declaration on Research Assessment, or DORA, he has guided the development of many of the improved ways in which researchers and their outputs are being evaluated. So I'd, I'd really like you to join me in welcoming a Professor Stephen Curry to our seminar today. So the seminar itself will be kind of like 40, 50 minutes, and then we'll take some questions after that. And you, you will see in the, in the, in the, at the footer of our, our screen there, there's a little Q&A button. So at any point, you can add your questions into that, and we will take up the questions then at the end. So thanks, everybody, for coming along today. And very warm welcome then to Professor Curry, and I'll just hand over to Professor Curry now, who can bring us through his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liam, uh, for that kind introduction. Let me just get my slides on the screen. And hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Uh, are, we, are we good to go? Yes. Good to okay. go. Okay. Uh, um, thank you very much. It's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm just sorry um, I can't be with you in person. I've never actually set foot on the campus of UCD, but I do have a, a connection uh, with the university because my father studied dentistry there in the 1950s and uh, spoke very warmly of his time as a student uh, in Dublin. And actually now there's a new connection between UCD and Imperial because your former president is shortly to become our next uh, president of the institution. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing what uh, Professor Brady can bring to um, Imperial College. So as Liam says, I'm going to talk um, um, about research assessment and responsible research assessment as we like to, to call it these days. Uh, and I'm doing so partly, um, largely, I guess, in my role as chair of the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how, why and how it came into being and what we're doing now. Uh, and then I want to make sure that we have plenty of time left uh, for uh, Q&A, because that's often the most valuable uh, aspect of these things. So please uh, warn me after 40 or 45 minutes and I will wrap up and make sure that we get to the get to the Q&A. Um, also, um, uh, my slides are open access and I have sent a copy to David Bennett and he's very welcome to share them with you. So I have tried to put links uh, to various papers and documents and websites that I'm mentioning along the way. So uh, you can get a copy from David so you don't have to scramble and try and write down very long uh, URLs uh, as we go along. So uh, this is a complex topic. Uh, I know Liam has sort of uh, previewed it by saying, you know, I'm going to give you answers and whatnot. And uh, uh, well, I think we have some suggestions and some ideas that uh, hopefully will take us in the right direction. But uh, I don't think this is a problem that we have fully solved yet. And it's one where continuing dialogue and discussion and negotiation of what's important to us all uh, and to the societies that we serve is something that we have to uh, keep uh, keep going at. So, uh, so let me start by 
um, um, sort of explaining kind of how I got into this um, into this area. I mean, as as uh, Liam said, I did I, I I do a fair bit of public engagement. I started writing a blog in about two thousand and eight, and it was that activity got me thinking about all this sort of uh, the uh, the meta stuff that goes on around science. I was a jobbing structural biologist academic uh, at the time. I played the impact factor game with the best of them to get myself promoted to. Um, professor, uh, but it was actually writing about science and thinking about the way that it, the culture works. Uh, and I was also took a sort of a, a strong interest in, in open access as a way of opening up uh, the academy in ways that I thought would be very beneficial uh, for society that got me then into thinking about, you know, modes of research assessment. Uh, because open access journals are, are hampered by the hegemony of uh, existing publications which rely very heavily on their publication metrics as a, as a as a tool for sales but one of the most striking examples of you know where we've gone wrong i think in terms of our processes of research assessment which are very tied of course to publication uh, came about in uh, 2016 so in the run-up if you remember to the olympics in rio de janeiro there was con concern about the rise of microcephaly in south america and the possibility had been raised that there was a link to Zika virus infections, which had spread uh, uh, east from uh, the sort of origin in, in Africa in the 1940s. And what happened at that time was that the Wellcome Trust led a consortium of funders and publishers uh, to encourage the uh, research community to publish their research on Zika virus infections, and particularly those that were probing links with microcephaly as quickly as possible. So they wanted people to share their data, to publish preprints on the internet, uh, but they had to then get an agreement with the publishers that anyone who did so would not be penalized down the line because they'd already published their uh, manuscript. And there used to be this thing called the Inglefinger rule, uh, which meant that if the manuscript was already on the internet, then many journals wouldn't uh, wouldn't deign to look at it. And that was, of course, a big barrier because people need the publications on their CVs in order to uh, advance their careers and make the case for uh, for future funding. So, uh, you know, we, so what we had to do to address a very serious public health um, um, issue was suspend normal practice. And what that tells you is that normal practice had then brought the academy into conflict with the public interest uh, writ large. Here was a major health uh, crisis that needed to be sorted out. And what the scientific community were doing initially was, uh, uh, was not sharing their data, delaying it because of their own career interests, which is an entirely rational view given a system that they operate in and, uh, and didn't uh, control. Uh, but it just shows you how uh, our culture of assessment has come into opposition uh, with the public need. And of course, what's true for dealing with Zika virus is equally true for coronavirus. Uh, SARS coronavirus 2, and we've seen the rise of uh, pre-printing and data sharing that's been extraordinarily helpful uh, in addressing uh, the pandemic. But it's also then true not just of dealing with other infectious diseases, but with any uh, area of research or scholarship where there is a public interest and when there is a large degree of public funding. Uh, COP26 is happening right now. One of the major challenges for the human race uh, is dealing with climate change and the research community is going to have a very large part to play in that. And why aren't we working as hard and as fast and sharing our information as quickly as possible um, in order to address that problem? And so, you know, there is an issue, um, I think, um, within research assessment is that we've kind of lost sight really of the breadth of, of what we value. And in my thinking about this, I've been greatly influenced by a philosopher called Michael Sandel, who works at Harvard, uh, who gave a great talk, and it's available on YouTube a couple of years ago. And here he was talking about politics, um, and he was uh, trying to understand why Britain had voted for Brexit, and why uh, the good people of the United States of America had elected a figure such as Donald Trump um, as, their, as their president. And he traced back the roots um, to, uh, and I think there is a, a, a case to be made, to the fact that through uh, sort of neoliberal market economics, which had, you know, taken over uh, government policy, certainly we've seen that in the UK, and I think one sees it in the, in the US, which had tended to negate the idea of uh, a common good or a public good. And he saw that the 
the vote for Trump and the vote for Brexit was uh, a sign of people felt disenfran disenfranchised, disempowered uh, from their communities and that you know, the market didn't really value their lives or their contributions. And so there was a, a protest against that. And I think that sense resonates with the, I guess the sort of neoliberal metricization of much of research activity that has taken place over the past um, couple of decades. So Sandel's point is, you know, he's talking about politics, but we equally, I think we could talk about uh, scholarship and, and research. We need to uh, tell stories around genuine appreciation uh, for contributions to the common life or the, to collective well-being and contributions that go beyond or, or evaluations that go beyond how the market rewards you or how the market defines the value of your contribution. And of course, as we're all well aware, uh, market value in academia tends to mean these days um, journal impact factors and uh, university league tables, which are two of the um, 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 most prominent forms of aggregate metrics or indicators uh, that I think are the most troubling um, for academia. So, you know, the use of impact factors and rankings has become normalized, but there are many, many problems uh, associated with that uh, metricization. So just to focus particularly on um, journal metrics, we know that it reduces productivity because we know that people, uh, you know, they write their manuscript, they shoot for the highest impact factor journal that they can manage, and that they are then prepared to, you know, suffer months and months of delay. Uh, if they're rejected, they will revise and resubmit and work their way down the hierarchy of journals because it is in their career in this interest to do so. I spoke a couple of years ago to a fellow of the Royal Society who was on their 10th journal and had spent 18 months not getting their work published. And this was work uh, that they thought was among the best that they had ever done in their, in their career. Uh, and yet uh, a, a, a publication ready manuscript had been delayed for a year and a half um, in order to uh, you know, get the points that come from publishing in the right uh, venues. We know, of course, there's positive bias in the literature that's been uh, long standing, but that's partly because there is no place for sharing negative results. Well, not really, uh, because journals don't like papers with negative results because they think they won't get cited and they think they will therefore have a negative effect on the journal's impact factor. And for them, of course, it is a, a marketing tool. And there are other broader cultural impacts. We know that uh, research and the academy is a, a competitive space and there is room, I think, for healthy competition. But I think also what we find ourselves, you know, the position we find ourselves in now is we have a, a state of hyper competition. And I've certainly heard this from my uh, young sort of PhD students and postdocs in my group who really feel that, you know, if they're not publishing in the right journals, then their career is already over. Uh, and the, the focus on publication tends to devalue other important academic activities and therefore devalues academics. Their contributions to teaching, for example, are extraordinarily valuable, but tend to be displaced by a focus on research. Uh, the obsession with metrics focuses on the what and not the how or the who. And so we tend to then discount uh, things that happen, like bullying that happens in the power, within the power dynamics of a, of a research group, for example. Uh, and we're not thinking about, you know, who exactly gets to be involved um, in the academy. Uh, it incentivizes fraud, unfortunately, uh, because of the very tight gearing between publishing in the right venue um, and uh, career advancement. Um, uh, we are rational agents, but unfortunately, uh, not all are entirely moral uh, agents. And although it's still obviously a, a, um, a minority um, occupation, there is a sense that, you know, we're not detecting at all and that, you know, and when um, a bad practice does come to light, that undermines reliability and public trust. And while actually the scientific community, certainly in the UK, uh, enjoys quite a large degree of public trust, I think there's over 80% approval rate for you know, research that doesn't have an immediate application. So there's a great deal of trust in scientists, much more so than in journalists or politicians, um, for example. Nevertheless, that's not something that we should ever think about taking for granted because it could, it could dissipate if we, uh, if we let it. And I think if more people realized that we delayed sharing our results with the rest of the scientific community or the scholarly community and the rest of the world because of our own personal career interests, I think they would be outraged and I think they would see a conflict 
with their interests uh, in that, and, that's, and, and they have justifiable interests. Uh, and we see here also, this is evidence of the, or a study on the, uh, the impact on the research culture. Uh, it shows that the increasing metricization is actually changing the way that research is done. Uh, this is work led by Sarah Dereike, who was one of the co-authors of the Leiden Manifesto and somebody that Dora uh, actually works with very uh, closely. I can't recommend her work highly enough, but she shows that, uh, or concludes that, you know, norms and criteria for scientific quality, such as epistemic originality, long-term progress, relevance to society, social responsibility, these receive less attention uh, or become redefined through their relations to quantitative indicators, okay? And so we end up, our incentives are uh, driving us away from um, many of the policy goals that our society is looking for um, in the academic community. And, and our use of metrics is, has become internalized. It's almost second nature now. So these are actual quotes from people I actually spoke to. Uh, I've anonymized them, but one deems, you know, our people know how to get the nature papers, not our people know how to do really important research. It's, it's signified only by the name of the journal. And then one young postdoc told me, I'm really excited. We just had a big paper in cell. And her first instinct was to tell me where she published her work. She didn't tell me anything about exactly what it was that she had discovered that was so exciting. And so there is an insidious um, impact on our uh, research culture. We are growing increasingly aware of the uh, impacts of this. This is just a selection of a few uh, sort of reports and studies that have appeared over the past uh, several years thinking about um, um, research culture and how it has been impacted by uh, metrics, um, uh, which I, um, you know, recommend to you for, uh, for further reading. But we need to really have a broader conversation about what it is um, that we value um, in research. And um, at Dora, then, I, this is a, a view that I would be uh, would like to advance in terms of, you know, what we think, uh, you know, research values look like, you know, we want reliable, rapidly communicated, accessible, high quality research that transforms our understanding of the world and changes it for the better. But we all need to think about researchers as people and we want, and we also, you know, research certainly these days, and particularly in the sciences and that's in STEM subjects is a team um, a team effort. Uh, so we want to incentivize researchers who to collaborate, who feel a duty of care to their group members, so who are interested in sustaining and nurturing the next generation uh, of colleagues, and who feel a responsibility to the societies of which they are part, and a system overall that values the people within it. At the moment, I think we praise too much value on the products, so the uh, the scientific papers mostly, uh, and on thinking about you know some of the inputs, you know the the big research grants. That's what we the value. What's what we value, and partly because those are more easy to measure with with metrics. Uh, but we need to take a more holistic and a broader view, and we need to think about the quality of life. We have a growing problem of um, mental ill health uh, in the academy that we need to think about how to reverse, and of course we need to seek out the creative vigor. Um, of diversity. If one looks at the, the demographics of the academy, and I know this from my own university, it is not representative um, of the society that it claims to serve. And that raises questions in an open democratic society about the legitimacy of a publicly funded um, academy. Is it really, um, does it have all the um, perspectives and is it asking all the most relevant questions uh, research questions um, that are most important to the society that we want to serve, notwithstanding, of course, the importance of academic freedom uh, and the right to choose, you know, what you are most interested in. Uh, but I think there are always interesting conversations um, to have uh, around that. Now, that's a nice utopian vision. Uh, uh, and the real hard bit is figuring out how we realize this in practice. And there are no easy solutions. I think there are some um, and uh, avenues that we uh, certainly should be traveling down and avenues that we should explore. All of those avenues we should subject to skeptical scrutiny uh, because even the best ideas can sometimes have um, unintended effects. But one of the things that I think is one of the movements that I think that is very important um, in this space and thinking about um, the values that we want to, to transmit is um, talking about how open science can be 
uh, better science. I'm not saying that open science is always better science, because uh, very much you have to judge the work on the uh, on its own merits. But I very much approve of the rise of preprints. It's fast, much faster communication. As we saw with the uh, Zika virus initiative, um, it fosters greater work. It gives, it, it means that we can extract more value more quickly uh, from research efforts in order to answer you know, really important questions um, such as you know, uh, public health and the impact on uh, Zika. I quite like the subversive aspect of preprints because it doesn't have a journal name associated with it. And therefore, if you're interested in reading it or if the title catches your eye, you have to make your own decision about whether or not you think it's worth reading beyond the abstract. So it really pro produces a focus on the content, not the container. Uh, it's still early days yet, but it encourages more open peer review because many preprint servers, including BioArchive, do allow comments underneath although it's still only 10 or 20% of articles that attract any commentary, but it provides much greater um, scrutiny. And open access generally, of course, allows a global audience, not just globally the um, academic audience, but a, a public audience, and that sharing and that increased scrutiny that arises because more people are able to read it uh, means that one can think about tackling the reliability problem. And we have seen that. Um, even during the COVID crisis, uh, and people have, you know, people have sometimes criticized preprints for being published, they're not peer reviewed. Uh, but actually on the preprint server, we have seen cases where they really got peer reviewed very, very quickly and within 24, 48 hours, uh, some of the rather shoddy work that has appeared on preprint servers has been removed because there was such a, uh, an immediate dissection um, of the flaws um, in the work. Uh, following on from thinking about open access is um, open data. It's the natural next step. Technically, it's more complicated to deliver because data, uh, uh, well, data certainly comes in many different formats. I'm fortunate working in an area, structural biology, where the, the data structures have been um, uh, basically figured out uh, about 40 years ago and the protein data bank um, has uh, has been a sort of landmark achievement in terms of uh, sharing data, and there's now a very good culture around that. But there are many other fields where either the data involves extraordinarily large files, and there are questions about who should pay for it, and there are questions about it's not sufficient just to dump the data onto a cloud server somewhere. It needs to be annotated. It needs to be um, um, placed in a form that form that is that is fit for sharing. But nevertheless, if you are obliged to share your data again, that opens it up to greater scrutiny. It also opens up to new forms of analysis. So you, one can potentially get much greater value out of the same work. Uh, and that has got to be in the in the public interest as well. And I would argue as a result that on balance, uh, open science is definitely better uh, for changing the world. And we've certainly seen that in terms of the Zika virus. And, and I guess I shouldn't call it the new coronavirus anymore since uh, we are now unfortunately extremely um, familiar with it. But there are lots of you know, intersecting um, issues here. And uh, this is a figure that I prepared uh, was about uh, February last year as I was trying to gear up for a, a talk on Dora uh, at the University of Zurich. But uh, one of the complications that I had always encountered was like, you can't really talk about research assessment without talking about other um, important cultural shifts that are happening um, within the academy. One of which is open scholarship, as I've just uh, mentioned, but the other uh, is the increasing attention now that we're paying towards um, equity, uh, diversity um, and inclusion. So. And you know, where these issues intersect, then there are you know, real uh, questions that we need to grapple with. Uh, and this, I hope, uh, helps to illustrate that you, know, you can't tackle one issue uh, without actually also thinking about the broader picture and thinking about these um, intersections. This issue is explored a little bit more depth in this uh, um, um, article here on the, on the DORA website that uh, was published last year. But you know, if you're thinking about um, um, you know reform of research assessment and open scholarship, you know there are questions about the focus on outputs, and one wants to think about the the qualities and varieties. One of the the barriers to open access journals is the hegemony of the established subscription journals, which have got um, um, you know a well-established reputation and generally higher impact factors, and it's very difficult for new journals to to break into the market. Not impossible, but I think if one gets to 
um, a mode of research assessment that really is focused on the content and not the wrapper, uh, then one can help to sort of deconstruct some of the barriers to, uh, to open scholarship. Uh, the whole idea of open scholarship is not just about, you know, open access and data sharing and sharing code, but actually it's about making the academy itself more open and, and more porous. And it has also then raised questions about, you know, who is, who is the academy open to? Okay, and we have seen, and you know, if you look at the statistics across Europe, just for example, is not very open to women. Okay, so there's still very much a minority among the professoriate, uh, certainly, even if there is more likely to be a gender balance at uh, uh, more early career uh, researchers. And so why is it that the academy is still not open uh, and fostering and nurturing the careers of women in the same way that it does, obviously, um, for men? And similar questions have to be asked around um, um, uh, people from ethnic minority backgrounds, disabled uh, scholars, um, um, LGBT scholars, uh, uh, for example. And of course, uh, research assessment is about making evaluations and all kinds of evaluations are subject to bias. Um, and so we have to challenge history. Uh, we still live in an age, apparently, where it's okay for certain Italian physicists to claim that physics was built by men, and therefore that, you know, women are no good at physics, uh, which is such an incredibly preposterous um, assertion that it's hard really to know where to start, and yet attitudes like that come out. I have met colleagues who uh, still think that men are better at math than women, and, and nonsense like that. And so there are stereotypes and historical biases that, that need to be challenged, and that that then is part of the process of opening up the academy to a much more diverse uh, and vigorous um, population. Now, again, you know, this is somewhat utopian in the vision, although I hopefully I'm pointing to some of the, the complexities uh, and recognizing that um, uh, progress will only really be made if one takes a systemic approach. But that progress will also only really be made as well if we are aware of many of the um, uh, real world constraints that are um, in operation. We know, you know, increasingly since World War II, um, there has been much greater government investment in R&D. Uh, I'm pleased to see that um, even though I'm no fan of the current UK government, they are still more or less committing to a long-term increase in the public investment um, in R&D. But with that investment comes greater scrutiny, uh, and some of those forms of scrutiny may or may not be um, healthy for the, uh, for the academy. But it's not unreasonable for democratically elected governments uh, to place expectations upon what they get uh, for their money. Uh, uh, we know that universities, and this seems to be universally true, uh, have enormous financial and time pressures. It's a highly competitive um, environment. Um, and of course, many of the measures that one uses uh, rely over much on metrics and on league tables. They focus on products, papers and grants, uh, and not necessarily uh, so much on people. And we still have, I think, within our culture, the idea of the the genius or the hero researcher, and I think that is um, given too much credence, particularly I think in the STEM subjects where uh, really, you know, the, the, you know, effective team management is such an important uh, thing, and where um, abuse of the power um, of a high-performing PI can sometimes be used to excuse bullying and exploitation of junior researchers. There's a tremendous uh, power differential within research groups that if one is not aware of it and does not then seek to mitigate it, and if one does not have PIs who are very mindful um, of the responsibility of nurturing uh, the, the people in, uh, in their groups, then uh, very bad things can happen. And we know that this happens all the time and uh, at a far too uh, high level. And we know that women and ethnic minorities uh, are particularly on the receiving end of you know, these kinds of bad behavior. And yet there is a strong perception in the sector, I think, that universities will protect people like that because they are star performers. And there have, of course, been um, notable cases, which, um, it, 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 well, they've reached the news, I think, now because the, the, uh, the individuals have been found out and brought to heel. Uh, but there is still clearly um, a, a very detrimental effect on our, on our culture. But, you know, so again, you know, there are lots of complications here. And with the best will in the world, 
uh, even you know, university management teams uh, do not always have the latitude or the freedom to operate according to their ideals that perhaps they would, uh, they would like. But we need to have a worldwide conversation um, about that. So that takes me on to the work of Dura, which um, 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 I hope most people in the room have heard of. I used to go around and give talks about Dora. Uh, well, I, uh, I talked about uh, research assessment and open access and whatnot, and I would ask how many people have actually heard of the Declaration on Research Assessment, and it was around the one percent level. Uh, fortunately, I did it recently um, at an event in London, which was organised by UCL, and it was about the twenty percent level. And most of the other people on the panel were disappointed that it was only twenty percent, and but I was the only person. Uh, who was actually rather pleased that it had uh, it had increased 20 fold in about five years. Clearly, there's a, a bit of work to go yet. Uh, hopefully, this audience is reasonably familiar with Dora since UCD is a, a, a signatory uh, and has, I think, done a very good job of uh, beginning to internalize what that means. Uh, the declaration uh, is best known, perhaps, for being down on journal impact factors. And so the primary recommendation is not to use journal-based metrics such as the impact factor as a surrogate measure of the quality of individual research and articles. I know there's a slippery argument because on average a paper in a high impact factor journal will be more interesting and more groundbreaking than one in a low impact factor journal, but that's the law of averages. That's not true of all the papers in both of those journals. Uh, and of course, um, the impact factor is just a one number that characterizes a very broad distribution of uh, citation rates of all the different papers in a journal. Um, most, something like two thirds to 70% um, of the papers in a journal do not get as many citations as are indicated by the impact factor. So many of the papers are riding on the coattails of a minority of very highly cited papers in any given, uh, any given journal. Now, although the declaration is known to be um, a relatively negative thing, there are, in fact, positive recommendations for different stakeholders, including funders, institutions, publishers, data providers and researchers. Uh, for institutions such as universities, it's really about being explicit about the criteria that one uses and placing much more emphasis on the content of a paper. And it is they do talk about scientific content or very much emerged from the uh, uh, cell and molecular sciences, and that's a perception perhaps we need to need to change. Uh, and then for the purposes of a research assessment, think about the value and impact of all research outputs, including data sets and software, uh, a broad range of impact measures, uh, such as influence on policy and practice. And I would include in that, you know, things like mentorship um, of PhD students and, and postdocs, which is a very important uh, research um, output. So the declaration itself um, is, uh, gosh, well, eight years old now. Uh, it actually was uh, drafted in a meeting in San Francisco uh, in the, at the end of 2012, but launched publicly in 2013. So we now have over uh, 18,000 individuals and over 2,000 uh, organizations that have signed. Uh, from 2017, so for the first uh, four or five years of its existence, Dora basically operated, operated out of the back office of the American Society for Cell Biology, which was one of the organizations that was present at the, at the first meeting, um, and, but it was done in somebody's spare time, and so it didn't really get an awful lot of traction for a lot, very long time, and probably still true in some, uh, for some users. If you type Dora into Google, you get uh, Dora the Explorer, who is a, a, a figure, a, a character from a very good uh, and interesting series of uh, children's books. And there's now even a movie as well. Uh, but hopefully more people are actually hearing about Dora, the, uh, the declaration and the organization. Um, but so since 2017, we've got significant new financial support. And this is our current list of um, supporting organizations. Uh, there's a sort of hierarchy of how much money they uh, give us. But our main funders are Howard Hughes, the Swiss National uh, Science Foundation and UKRI, and but we also get substantial money uh, from all these other uh, organizations who are a mixture of publishers and uh, learner societies and uh, funding um, organizations. So that gives us uh, uh, the funds to run an office uh, which runs out of Washington, so it's still hosted by the ASCB, but we now have 2.2 members of uh, staff uh, plus an intern, which we're just recruiting for. 
Um, and, but with that uh, dedicated staff, actually, we've been able to really ramp up uh, the level of activity um, that we can do. We have an international steering group, which I have the privilege to chair, and we formed uh, in 2018 a global advisory board, and all members of these uh, committees are volunteers, give their time freely. But we really wanted a global advisory board because uh, scholarship and the academy is very much an international entity. And the problems around research assessment are worldwide. Um, the scholars are very mobile. And, um, uh, and so there's no point fixing research assessment in Britain or in Europe. Uh, because uh, in China or in South America or in the United States, then um, um, the, the old rules apply. And so one has to take a global approach. So our advisory board, we went out and we got uh, representatives from every continent and, and on the planet. So that, and that really has been very useful in giving us a perspective, particularly from uh, the global south. Uh, and we've recently, haven't quite announced it yet, but uh, we've recently actually merged the steering group and the global advisory board with a commitment to ensure that that uh, really is globally um, representative. And so that's helping to sort of uh, form the strategic vision uh, for DORA. The roadmap that we set ourselves uh, uh, three or four years ago, and we probably will update this next year, was one to recruit more signatories or you know, make sure that more people have heard of the declaration. We wanted to extend the global and disciplinary impact. We, again, I said we were kind of born in the, uh, in the life sciences, but clearly the issues that we are addressing apply uh, to all other areas and particularly social sciences and humanities, for example, uh, where maybe there's less concern about general impact factors, but uh, then people tend to be judged on the name of the publisher that they published their book with. And so um, uh, the, the problem is not er eradicated, it's just transformed. But in particular, the thing that we wanted to do was to be much more proactive about going out and discovering experiments where people had produced innovations in research assessment and to actually work ourselves and collaborate with other organizations and to develop new tools and practices because a common complaint that we would hear was that well if you're going to tell us we can't use the impact factor what else are we going to do you know we can't read all the papers of all the applicants it's simply not reasonable to uh, expect people to do that and certainly it isn't and so that's why we have really wanted to make sure that uh, we can sort of um, showcase um, um, solutions that people can try for themselves while recognizing that, you know, there is no one size fits all. This is an area where many people are still experimenting. And I think the outcomes of those experiments are they're not in yet. Um, but we definitely want to encourage people uh, to be thinking about, you know, how we can do research assessment better, because it's really important to do good research assessment, because you do want to fund the best research and you do want to fund the best people. But it's really thinking about, well, what do we mean by best um, in this context? So uh, here, these are, uh, there's lots of resources on our website, which you can find here. These are a couple of briefing notes. Uh, again, just sort of outlining the main issues and setting out, for example, ideas for actions and design principles that one can use if one is looking to reform uh, practice around research assessment, busting some of the common myths about evaluation. But, uh, but then also addressing the, the key area of unintended biases. And, and there does tend to be a, a, an assumption that, well, if you use metrics, well, that's objective information. And if you're using more qualitative information, then you are opening the door for all sorts of biases and that would be terrible. And that is true. It does open the door. And so one has to be very aware of that. But I think one also wants to be to caution, say that, well, just it, well, two things. One is metrics are not objective. OK, so citations, for example, arise because of the subjective decision by one researcher somewhere to cite a particular paper. And those decisions are themselves uh, subject to many types of uh, biases. But also when thinking about change, um, you know, you cannot expect the change to be perfect straight out of the box. And I think uh, if one is holding any proposed reform to that standard, then nothing will ever happen. And so well, I think we have to be honest that we are proposing ideas for change. We're not 100% sure that they are going to be work perfectly as, as we hope or as we intend. Uh, but that we will maintain a healthy skepticism and that we will subject uh, the, the innovation to evaluation down the line. Uh, and this is all of a piece with our more systemic approach to thinking about how one gets uh, reform of research assessment. 
Uh, one of the other things that we have started to do is to run meetings or to run sessions within existing um, scientific uh, meetings. Um, I'm very keen on the kind of ambush model uh, because you will, if you if you run a conference on research assessment, then the same people will just turn up time and time again, and it's usually the people who are interested in research assessment, and they are not the ones that you need to persuade um, how to change. But we did <clears throat> one of the most important meetings we had was just at the end of uh, 2019, just two years ago, and this was organised jointly with the uh, Howard Hughes Institution. Uh, and uh, brought together uh, quite a range of different uh, people, people who are interested in research assessment, but also you know, vice presidents of research from various different uh, universities, publishers and members of learning societies to think about um, how you drive institutional change and think about the sort of the, the systemic uh, issues that you're going to have to grapple with. Uh, there are, um, if you go on the DORA website, you can actually see some of the talks from the meeting, but it was also, we wrote it up uh, as part of a sort of survey of um, current experiments in changing practice and identifying the issues that had been uh, discussed at the meeting. This provides what we hope is a useful framework for action, uh, which breaks down into four elements. Basically, you know, making sure that one understands within the institution what the obstacles to change are uh, in the way that research is assessed. Um, giving yourself the freedom to experiment, uh, even if you think, you know, the experiment may not work out, but um, um, it's important to, to have that freedom. And sometimes that means maybe not doing it in the public domain, uh, but also then importantly, making sure that one creates a shared vision and communicates that vision so that uh, it's very much any change is introduced through genuine consultation. Uh, with the academic community, who ultimately will be the ones um, um, that new methods of uh, research assessment are, are applied to. So uh, there's many other instances of good practice, not just things that DORA has been involved in, uh, but there are examples from around the world that we have gathered and curated. And so uh, our revamped website, from uh, which was revamped uh, last year, uh, does a better job of structuring the different resources uh, that are available. So I would uh, recommend that to you. One of the other ways in which we try to uh, maximize the value of our operation is by uh, collaborating with other uh, organizations. And we, one of the ones that we did a, a couple of years ago was to work with the Royal Society uh, to help sort of in the development of their approach to the, uh, the narrative CV format. So this is a way of providing a concise and structured summary of uh, research contributions. There are different ways that one can think about um, of configuring this, but this the idea here is that you know rather than then, you know at least in the first triage uh, of you know people applying for grants or applying for jobs or for promotion, uh, one asks them to highlight their most important contributions. You know how have you contributed to the generation of knowledge? You know tell us about your three or four most important papers and tell us why you think they're important. Uh, you know how have you contributed to development of people in your team? Uh, have you contributed to the wider research community, to your discipline, uh, and what contributions have you made to, to broader society? Um, and this uh, format is now being adopted by UKRI, and so they are going to roll this out across all of the uh, funding programs from the UK uh, research councils, and they have signed a sort of memorandum of understanding uh, with a range of other uh, UK funders, including Wellcome, but also the Royal Academy of Engineering, Cancer Research, for example. Uh, and so this is a tool that is, um, um, I think, is gaining traction. It's not uh, a silver bullet. There are issues with it to do with, you know, the uh, differentiating between, you know, good salespeople and people who are, uh, you know, genuinely good researchers, but maybe not so good at uh, putting themselves forward. And uh, again, you know, in Dora, we are working on that. We had a workshop two or three weeks ago where we sort of tried to dissect some of the early experiments and Science Foundation Ireland was very much um, a part of that and is doing some really great work uh, in this space. Uh, and also then analyzing and trying to mitigate the potential biases that are introduced when one has more qualitative uh, forms of assessment. But there are lots of experiments going on. The Charité Hospital in Berlin, uh, which is, uh, uh, has a focus not just on contributions, but also is asking people to think about their contributions to, to, uh, to open science. So there are different ways that, uh, that one can um, configure this. Uh, other collaborations we've entered into are one with Wellcome, who've developed a policy on 
uh, um, um, research assessment. And so now Welcome have a condition that they will not fund researchers unless they are working at an institution that has either signed DORA or has in effect implemented the principles of DORA. So introduced um, a responsive approach to metrics and to uh, research assessment. And that's actually had quite an impact um, in the UK. Uh, and then uh, we also working with uh, UKRI and uh, the Research on Research Institute, which is a relatively new body um, established in the UK. Uh, we prepared a paper for the Global Research uh, Council Conference, which is an international meeting of all the national uh, funders, has over 100 uh, members, talking about and analysing the opportunities for funders to help set the agenda uh, with regard to responsible research assessment. So, the, you know, these are issues and this is an approach that is being um, developed worldwide and we are very keen to see it um, promoted and taken up. One other important resource that we have are uh, case studies uh, that we have gathered from institutions around uh, the world. And these are universities for the most part that have signed DORA and taken strides to really think through the process of implementation um, and how you know, they have made it work for them. I'm a great believer in the notion that nothing succeeds like success. And so that if universities that you know, haven't yet started to think about this, and I certainly wouldn't put UCD in that category, um, um, have an example, example to look to uh, and to, you know, to, to think through and to see how other people have overcome some of the barriers that they might assume um, are, um, are in place. And uh, ideally, of course, in a year or two's time, it would be great to see uh, UCD uh, on this list as, a, as an exemplar uh, case study. And um, getting uh, to, to the end of my presentation, but a couple of other tools just to highlight since they come out uh, recently. Uh, again, for institutions to think about how you know their own um, approach to the business of uh, of reforming research assessment practices, we have developed uh, with uh, Professor Ruth Schmidt, who was one of the people who presented at our Howard Hughes meeting a couple of years ago, uh, a rubric, a sort of metrics called space. Uh, space to evolve um, um, academic assessment. So this is a way of trying getting, uh, allowing an institution either to assess where it is and try and identify what are the most likely barriers uh, to changing their assessment practices, or if they have already sort of started down that path, um, it's a way of you know structuring the thinking around you know how well um, changes in process are working out. Are they having the impacts then? that were intended in the first place, or does one need to do a, a change of course? And we were very pleased earlier this year to get a, a large grant from uh, the Arcadia Foundation, uh, $1.2 million, which allows us to, has allowed us to launch Project Tara. Uh, and that's a multi-pronged uh, project, which we're doing both in collaboration with Professor Ruth Schmidt, but also with Professor uh, Sarah Dereika from Leiden. Uh, looking to uh, develop tools to advance research assessment. And there's, there's several elements to this. One is a dashboard, which will allow us to try and uh, track the development of um, good practice and good policy in institutions uh, worldwide. Uh, we're also gonna do some uh, research uh, in the US because we've noticed there, there's been a relatively low level of uptake of uh, DORA among US uh, universities. There's been much stronger uptake uh, within Europe and other parts of the world, uh, and we want to investigate why that is. Uh, anecdotally, uh, some of my US colleagues have told me, well, it's because Europeans are far more obsessed with metrics than we are uh, over here, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily uh, entirely true or entirely the experience of early career researchers uh, looking to get jobs in the, in the United States. Uh, so we're, we're going to sort of look at and try and understand you know, those, uh, those factors and, and help maybe perhaps unblock um, some of the resistance, or maybe then identify, you know, instances of good practice that have evolved entirely independently of DORA. I mean, I, I have long said, I don't care whether people sign DORA or not. What I care about is that they have really good processes of uh, research assessment. And from both of those uh, sort of uh, elements, we then will also then look to develop uh, and enhance our toolkit of resources to, uh, to help people um, um, experiment with innovative ways of uh, doing research assessment. So uh, clearly that's already started at uh, UCD and I uh, have read your 
um, statement on the responsible use of research metrics. And uh, to me, it, it reads like an exemplary document. I really like the fact that it's uh, the statement is you know founded on our values, and I think it's really important going back to Michael Sandel's lecture to think about you know what are your values and to think about the big picture, which I think you know many of us had when we were young and when we first came into the academy. You know we wanted to understand the world and and to change it, but the system does tend to grind you down. You know once you get plugged in and you got to get grants and you got to publish papers. Uh, it, it does tend to sort of eradicate some of that initial idealism and some of that you lose sight of the, the core values that brought you in in the first place. Uh, clearly, you know, it has been informed by DORA and the Lag Manifesto and the Metric Tide Report uh, and seems to be a very sensible and you know, context sensitive approach uh, to research evaluation. And again, clearly, uh, you know, we thought about the, the interaction with culture. Uh, and with the equality, diversity and inclusion, which is obviously impacted by uh, research assessment. We, we certainly see that at Imperial um, and because we see an erosion of the representation of women and ethnic minority uh, staff as one goes to uh, higher levels within the organization. So there were a couple of um, questions that came through. So I'm, you know, as a prelude, I guess, to the open Q&A, which I'm very happy to entertain. Um, and David Bennett kindly forwarded to me um, a couple of questions. I don't know who asked these, but if you want to identify yourselves afterwards, that's that's uh, that's fine. Uh, what will research impact mean in 2030? Well, uh, how long have you got? Um, um, I'm not entirely sure, but clearly, uh, uh, you know, we have just had a pandemic. Well, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, um, um, but clearly science has had an enormous um, and positive role uh, in that, not just with vaccine development, but with the discovery and repurposing of new drugs uh, for treating people um, who are infected, with really establishing that, you know, if wearing masks does help to reduce transmission. The data on that for many infectious diseases was very equivocal even prior to the uh, prior to the pandemic. And clearly there are many areas of uh, 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 worldwide activity that uh, will benefit from research. Um, we have the COP22 climate summit uh, at the moment, and obviously people are very worried and very concerned about uh, you know, the, the climate future of the planet, but clearly there are, there are going to be um, scientific and technological innovations that are going to help this. I mean, decarbonizing our energy supplies, um, it's only science and engineering that are really going to, to tackle uh, the challenges there. And there are so many other areas uh, uh, with, to do with biodiversity, uh, where you know uh, scientific impact is important. And I do think it's important that we are incentivizing real world impact. It's even harder to measure, <coughs> excuse me, of course, than academic impact, which you know to a degree one can look at citations to get some information on that. Uh, but I would just draw your attention. There's an interesting. This is a paper or an article in Nature from 1999, uh, talking about science's new social contract. And so um, the key point. Uh, is that, you know, the more open and comprehensive the scientific community, the more socially robust will be the knowledge. So it's knowledge that's not just robust in terms of being reliable, but it's robust in terms of it clearly has a value and impact uh, on the society that it's, it's, it's tending to serve. And for the, a long time in the post-war period, the academic community was kind of left alone uh, and wasn't really told what to do or nobody was really trying to set the agenda. But the assumption was that, you know, within themselves, if you let them get on, they would look at interesting questions and they would do rigorous uh, work um, in order to uh, in order to address that. But there has been a shift uh, because of the increase in public funding, and hopefully that will only increase uh, further. Uh, but of course, that means that I think we do have to think more and more about our interactions with the rest of society and about our responsibilities uh, to, um, to the governments that, that provide funding. And Gibbon's conclusion in 99, so uh, uh, what's that, 30 years ago, um, it can only be produced by much more sprawling so socio-scientific constituency, constituencies with open frontiers. And so I think there will be I hope there will be much more interaction between the research community and uh, society at large. That can happen in lots of different ways, uh, but I think that that would be a very interesting experience for, uh, for the scientific community. I think who often tend to think of the public as a rather homogenous and uninformed mass, uh, and that's a very disparaging way um, and to think of them. One experiment I would like to see personally 
would be for funders to sort of set aside a tranche of research funding that the academic community can apply for, but the awarding panel is made up entirely of members of the public. Um, I think that would be a very interesting experiment to do and would make the community think much more about its uh, scientific impact. Uh, here, uh, the second question, and this, this is the second of three. Uh, so DORA, as well as the Light Manifesto and the Hong Kong Principles are targeting policymakers as administrators. Uh, while some senior researchers are very reluctant to change because they built their career around metrics and early career researchers are still being taught by these senior researchers to chase after metrics. So what are the next steps in changing attitudes uh, of senior researchers and ECRs and what other changes may be needed to complement research assessment uh, reforms? And so that's, you know, that's a very good question and a, and a difficult question. My advice always to early career researchers is that uh, and often, you know, they still cling to the ideals that brought many of us into a scientific career in the, in the first place. But uh, I think they also, I, I would encourage them to, you know, cling to their ideals, but to actually, you know, uh, be very clear eyed about the way the world works right now. And it certainly should not be, um, um, uh, you know, the onus on change should not be placed on them. And I do think there is a, a responsibility for, you know, my generation of scientists, which has, you know, as I said, I think at the beginning, you know, I played the game with the best of them for a long time and saw the light only, only later. I hope I'm perhaps redeeming myself now through the work that I do for, uh, for, for Dora. Uh, but I think one has to be very um, aware of and to a degree sympathetic to the concerns of established senior researchers who see the rules of the game changing. Uh, and I think when you change the rules, it's really important to be transparent and to enter into dialogue uh, with them, ideally before changes are made. Uh, but even afterwards, there's an interesting situation developing in the Netherlands right now where there is, in fact, a nationwide program to reconfigure the uh, recognition and reward uh, system. This has prompted a furious backlash from a number of senior uh, professors. There was a letter co-authored by professors Poot and Mulders, which was signed by about 170 uh, Dutch professors. And they are worried that, uh, so the University of Utrecht is getting rid of the impact factor and, um, and, and configuring its research assessment on a broader set of criteria uh, that is entirely consistent with the, the DORA uh, philosophy, but they are worried that uh, you know this system will lead to randomness and compromising of scientific quality and of serious consequences uh, for the recognition and evaluation of Dutch scientists. So they're worried about you know Dutch universities losing positions in league tables, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you know those are, I guess I, I'm sure genuinely felt fears, and I think there's a genuine and uh, 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 concern for the quality of of Dutch science. I think at the same time, there is an argument that we really do have to think more broadly about what it is we mean by quality. And for Putin Mulders, basically scientific excellence is publishing in journals with high impact factors. Okay, that's the, that's the guts of their argument. They recognize they will pay lip service to the idea that, well, the impact factor is not very, not, you know, it has got problems with it. And it is important to recognize other things like mentorship, but it's scientific excellence and it's journal impact factors that, that really matter. And I, I think that view has to be understood, but has to be challenged. Uh, Sarah de Rijka is quoted in the article, the issue is not arbitrariness, uh, but it's about unlearning the unhelpful shortcuts and proxies and relearn how to, how to undertake in-depth contextual um, evaluation. And I think we do have to do the hard work of, uh, of doing that. Uh, we've addressed some of these issues in papers that I've referred to uh, earlier. And then there's one uh, interesting thing that happened is about when was that, 2013, yeah, so it's eight years now. Randy Shekman is a very well-known um, cell biologist, won the Nobel Prize in 2013. Uh, he's also an excellent uh, PR man because on the day that he was due to get his award in Stockholm, he announced that he would no longer be publishing in Cell Science and Nature. And he was immediately denounced as a hypocrite uh, because he had just been awarded the Nobel Prize on the back of a CV that was uh, littered with cell science uh, and nature papers. Um, but even so, I, I have to say, I take my hat off to the man um, 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 because he was drawing attention to the, to the systemic problem. Uh, people did question, well, what's the impact on the junior team members in his group if he's saying, well, we're not publishing there. 
And I think Schechtman, by being a Nobel laureate, is in a position to entirely mitigate those effects because obviously his PhD students and postdocs, they work in the lab of a Nobel Prize winner, so that helps. And he can, in his reference to them, explain that, you know, this is lab policy and that, and he, and he can then vouch for the quality of the work uh, that the younger scientists um, have done. So I would like to see more people, more Nobel Prize winners and more fellows of the Royal Society uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, maybe do the, the Schechtman uh, maneuver. And then finally, uh, one area I'd love to hear his thoughts on is how to responsibly manage bibliometric performance of the university overall. Um, many perceive Dora as countering the validity of bibliometrics. However, the overall the university is still evaluated by government and by rankings agencies on citation impact. And given that the university's citation performance is just the aggregate, how can we responsibly manage uh, recognize and incentivize individual academics to contribute to improving that overall university citation metric. So a couple of things to say there. One is that, you know, if you are considering, you know, an aggregate performance of many individuals, then looking at citations is not a bad thing to do and is certainly not disallowed by DORA. Uh, there are some people who um, uh, pronounce on DORA without actually having read the declaration. Uh, it does not ban metrics. It simply says you shouldn't place undue weight on you know, aggregate metrics such as the journal impact factor. But one of the suggestions it makes is to you know, include other metrics as well if you, are, if you are presenting them, or to use you know, article level metrics if you are thinking about you know, an individual's contribution. Uh, one thing I would caution, though, is I know that uh, university league tables have taken um, 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 or have grown uh, as an industry, have an enormous amount of influence, do affect the way decisions may, are made by students in selecting universities. Uh, sometimes governments will only award scholarships uh, to students going to universities that are in the top 200. You know, it's kind of crazy stuff like that. But I would encourage you to look at the methodologies behind uh, university league tables. Uh, Lizzie Gann has written very uh, persuasively on this and is uh, a sort of leading figure in the uh, I norms, uh, which I can't remember what it stands for exactly, but the RM bit is research managers. Uh, and questioning the validity and the quality of the information that you get from uh, league tables, and I've done so myself. This is a graphic showing the methodology for the Times Higher, which is one of the more prominent ones. Uh, but you will notice that um, um, you know teaching is thirty percent of the of the um, uh, score, research is thirty percent, and then citations are thirty percent. So citations are actually a, a minor component. Um, of the score. And if you look at research and teaching, then the major chunk is a reputation survey. I have no idea who fills in these surveys. I don't know, you know, who's the demographic? How do they, is it balanced? Is it gender balanced? Uh, how do they deal with conflicts of interest or people abusing it and thereby, you know, uh, giving a favorable score to their own university? It's completely unknown. Uh, and I imagine most people who fill out these surveys probably look at the league tables from the previous year in order to make their assessment. So I would caution about um, subjugating oneself to the agenda setting um, of university rankers. I have managed to uh, persuade um, Imperial to at least add a sort of health warning. Uh, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, our um, uh, strategic planners, they do pour over university league table results when they come in. Uh, we do publish the information on our website. Uh, but one of the things I really wanted um, us to send a message about was because, you know, when, uh, you know, a story comes out about this or that ranking and, you know, we've got this position, there's often a digest that the information is then sent out to many staff. And, you know, while at the same time that we're making many efforts to think about our research culture, to think about how we value people and to think about how we value the broad range of things that we do, we then send out things where it's obvious that somebody has spent days and days analyzing really, really tiny shifts in the score of this or that department on a ranking. And it tends to undermine that because at the end of the day, it shows that the university is spending an awful lot of time worrying about you know, positions on league tables. And I wanted us to send a message that you know, rankings do not drive us, uh, people do. And to think about, we can't ignore rankings. They're not going to go away. It would be foolish. Uh, you know, not to say anything about them. It's the real world. Nevertheless, I think one wants to make sure that the, the correct message is going out and that one is, you know, keeps rankings in their box um, as far as possible. 
So I'm very happy to take uh, more questions. Oh, uh, uh, I'll maybe step over that one, but we'll maybe come back to it if anyone wants to ask me about the University of Liverpool. Uh, but I will thank you for your attention and I will be very happy to take uh, any questions. And, and thank you very much, uh, Stephen, um, for your excellent and in insightful presentation. Um, I think we do have a few more questions that have just come in. Um, mm -hmm. What I'll do is I'll, I might just read them out and then yes. um, if you could try and answer it as, as best you can um, in the time that we have available. So um, the first one is from Emma Doris, and she's kind of wondering, and you touched on some of this already, but she's just wondering about you know, the additional burden on researchers, especially young researchers and early, early career researchers, that they have to focus a lot of their attention on their traditional expectations or on publications. Uh, but is there a risk then of, of just adding additional elements to an overburdened workload rather than initiating true change to the system? Uh I think yes, there is a risk um, of that, Emma. Um, I mean, I think if it's if the if any uh, change in practice is is presented in the wrong way, uh, and particularly, I guess you know, if you're an early career researcher and you are still a you know a PhD student or a postdoc, where um, if you're lucky, you get to spend 100% of your time you know doing your research, uh, then um, um, I do think you want to be careful about. Um, 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 uh, you know, overburdening yourself with with other things. I mean, uh, and if you are thinking, you know, long term about establishing an, an academic career, then clearly, you know, demonstrating your capacity to, you know, um, come up with interesting questions and and deliver uh, a completed and published, you know, complete study, whichever way uh, it happened to go, uh, then that's got to be your priority. That said, you know, I have met many in highly inspirational people who, in addition to doing that, you know, have thrown themselves heart and soul into doing public education, and it's because of what they love. Now, they are working more than nine to five to do that, uh, and that is their decision. But that I, I would, I would always, you know, while it's extremely laudable, I, I would hope that they're getting good career advice from their uh, PI about what they think is the is the next step. I have to say. I was always fairly strategic myself. You know, the advice I got after my PhD was that, you know, if you want to, if you're looking for a postdoc lab, you want to, you want to go to a lab that's a good place to be seen leaving. Okay. Uh, and also you do want to uh, get involved in projects where actually there is a good chance that you will get a publishable result within uh, the time scale of the project. You know, there's no point shooting for the moon if the moon is, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a blue origin and not SpaceX, put it that way, um, um, because you may, you know, uh, you may, you may lose out. I work in a field structural biology and I'm a protein crystallographer and, uh, you know, 90% of the work of any project is, you know, to grow crystals of your protein. And if you can't get crystals, you ain't got squat, you know, so it's a high risk, um, a high risk um, operation. And I would always, and I have to say, I would always advise even, well, crystallography, I think is maybe particularly acute, but of course, many other areas come with with associated risks but you know and embarking on an academic career is basically deciding to become a professional gambler um and you kind of uh, there is a you know the, there's a certain reality to that i think for a long time i think a lot of people embarked on a phd and then maybe a postdoc and they assumed that they were on a career ladder and we know that um um the numbers of faculty positions is much smaller than the PhD or postdoc population. And I think one needs to be very well aware of that. And at the same time, I think it's really important for universities to communicate to people that the training and learning that you get through doing a PhD is extraordinarily valuable um, in many other you know, areas of, of work. Uh, one of the things I really dislike among some of my colleagues is when they transmit the view to students that, you know, if, to our undergraduates, that if they're not thinking about embarking on postgraduate study, then they're somehow settling for second best. And to my mind, that's an extraordinarily narrow-minded and ignorant view from somebody who clearly has never stepped foot outside academia into the uh, into the real world. But so you know, but so 
so yes and no, I think is the answer. Okay, so <laughs> so you you know don't burden yourself. Think about your priorities, and you know you have to think strategically about your career. But of course, it's really important to do things that you that you love doing and enjoy doing. And I I get tremendous benefit or uh, satisfaction from doing public engagement. The public and particularly children, I have to say, they ask far better questions than academics do, uh, far harder questions and more interesting questions. So it you know it is a it is a great thing to be able to do. So. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, try and strike a balance. Thank you very much, uh, um, Stephen. Um, we've got another um, question from an anonymous attendee, and the question really is about what are the most common objection objections that people encounter when they try to advocate for DORA in their institutions? And in your experience, how are these best rebutted? Um, Okay, so the most common one is for people to say, well, you know, we know the journals that we think are good and we're comfortable with that. And there is this uh, argument about the law of average, which is that, you know, a high impact factor journal, I mean, uh, so impact factor is a measure of average citation performance, but, um, but one has to recognize that, you know, that's a very simplistic way. And actually the impact factor is not a good predictor of the citation performance of any given paper. So the argument is from the data, and we did publish a preprint where uh, in 2016, um, we wanting and um, producing a methodology for calculating the citation distributions for every journal uh, from which the impact factor is calculated. And the impact factor is an arithmetic mean, but the distribution is not a normal distribution. So statistically, it is extremely dubious practice. The median might be a better, a better measure. Uh, but it shows you that, you know, within any journal, within nature, for example, the, the citation range is over three orders of magnitude. OK, and nature publishes many papers that get zero or one citation. And uh, and I remember talking to Phil Campbell about this, and he's very proud of these papers. He will defend them to the hilt and say we thought they were good uh, and we wanted to publish them, you know, and we think it's we think it's good work. It doesn't it doesn't matter to him that it uh, uh, that it that it did that way. But, uh, but the, the argument is that, you know, on average, the impact factor does tell you something about the paper. Um, well, sorry, it does tell you something about the, the average paper in the journal, but you're never, you're never assessing the average paper. You're always assessing an individual paper. And it might be a star performer. It might have more citations than the impact factor, in which case, you know, brag about that in your application. Um, or it may be that actually it doesn't, and in which case you will quietly drop it and you'll mention the impact factor of the paper because you're basically claiming credit from other people who published in the, in the same journal. There is an argument that journals with high impact factors, they do a better job of peer review. I, I haven't seen a shred of evidence that that is true. Uh, and if somebody knows of it, a study, then I'd be really interested to see it. Um, I review for a wide range of journals, and I would like to think that I bring the same level of uh, acuity and expertise to that job, you know, irrespective of the, the the name of the journal or the or the impact factor. And of course, we know that um, you know uh, uh, peer review is is tremendously imperfect, very stochastic, particularly in highly selective journals. Nature only publishes eight percent of the manuscripts that are submitted to it. Uh, they famously rejected twice the discovery of graphene. Um, which went on to win the Nobel Prize. And that's, that's not to sort of take a, a, a jab at, at nature. It's just to show you how hard it is, actually, even with peer review, to judge the future impact um, of a particular discovery or, or, or a piece of work. It's a genuinely difficult thing uh, to do. But it's, the, but it's this, this law of averages thing. And my counter to that is that we're not assessing averages. We're assessing individual people and individual um, pieces of work. Uh, we have a couple more questions, uh, question. so thanks very much for that uh, answer. Um, the, the next question is um, from uh, Neve Ningaon, and um, she's basically asking um, about the importance of creating um, interdisciplinary open research networks. So if you look at things like, say, climate change, and you have to bring a lot of actors together to solve these problems, but how can open research projects like DORA embed these networks across publics and across disciplines, across policy and across government to solve these problems? 
Um, okay, well I, well, I don't know that what Dora can do to embed it. I, th I certainly think we can highlight their importance. And I think it's, uh, you know, as Neve makes the point, it's, it, it is clearly the case that there are many areas where the, the research has to be interdisciplinary. I think it's up to universities to actually recognize that and then to try and do what they can, you know, to break apart departmental silos. I think we see that a lot. I mean, I mean, Adam here. So I work in a department of life sciences uh, that we have a department of chemistry or a department of uh, physics. Uh, but actually our department of chemistry is highly interdisciplinary and they don't, as we had a presentation from the head of department uh, just recently, because they've got a new, they've got a new building that they're very happy with, but they really rethought their, you know, what type of chemistry department do we want to be in 10 years time? And they are thinking about things like, you know, drug development, they're thinking about climate change, about energy supply, and thinking more broadly about, well, what are the really interesting problems that chemistry can have an impact on? And so, they don't frame themselves as a department of, you know, um, physical chemistry and organic and inorganic. They, you know, those are gone, um, and it's all about, you know, thinking about the the interdisciplinary nature. And uh, and I have to say, you know, Imperial is is relatively good at that sort of thing. And so, in addition to the departments, we do have centers. Um, so we have one for climate change, for example. And even some of our departments are relatively new. We have one bioengineering, you know, it sits within the Faculty of Engineering, but it's obviously they hire people from the life sciences and from chemistry and, uh, and, and from medicine. Uh, and so it does, you know, it does help to bring people together. It is around thinking about, you know, what's the potential real world impact that you can do. So I think, you know, universities can do a lot to, to promote that. In terms of assessment of interdisciplinary work, it does become a bit difficult. And, and I know that people sometimes find it hard to get it published because it, you, you don't really know which journal to send it to. And, and if you send it to one set of experts, they say, well, I can't judge this. And, and uh, th that is a little bit of a structural issue, but hopefully journals are getting better at finding you know, more diverse sets of experts in order to, to review that type of work. But it's clearly important and clearly for many um, uh, important areas uh, and you know even the vaccine development and the rollout you know it wasn't just a matter of genetics and virology whatever but actually there's an awful lot of really important social science in terms of you know we learned there were issues that we were basically well learned it on the job a bit but you know how do you counter vaccine hesitancy for example or the just the massive amount of skepticism that erupted in certain quarters of the internet and whatnot and so you know if you are going to develop a successful vaccine it's you know it's it's not just doing medicine anymore that's important i think those lessons have been learned great so yeah thank you um a few more are coming in and we'll, 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 have, we'll try and answer the next few if we um, have the time. Um, there's a question here from uh, Barbara Dooley and uh, she's asking, how can we ensure that we move away from impact factors and citations towards narrative yeah. CVs so that females and minority groups um, engage with self-promotion, which for many is a, quite a, an uncomfortable activity. Yes, yes, that's, I mean, that's an interesting um, um, issue, and it is one that it can be dealt with, I think, at a number of levels. One is that, you know, if you're looking to recruit people, uh, one of the things that we have started doing more and more at Imperial um, is um, because we recognize that we don't get enough women applicants, we don't get enough applications from ethnic minority um, um, individuals, for example, is actually specifically going out and encouraging these individuals to apply. So if you're advertising a lectureship, we'll sort of talk to the faculty, okay, who are the, you know, the up and coming postdocs uh, from underrepresented groups, and then the head of the department will write to them and encourage them to apply. And so um, there is a I think there is some research which shows that, you know, it, when people look at a job description, if a man looks at it and he's and you know, I'm maybe giving it a bit of stereotypes here and looks down and thinks, well, I can do at least half of that and I can probably figure out the rest and they sling in an application. Uh, whereas if a woman looks at it, uh, they probably won't apply unless they think they can do 80, 90 percent of it. Now, that's a broad generalization and certainly not true of all people, but there is a certain degree of that. And I know that some universities and some companies have actually started just to simplify the job description or the person specification in order to reduce that barrier, but being more proactive about encouraging people to apply and, and supporting them. And one of the things that has, I think, worked well is that, you know, even if people apply and they're unsuccessful, 
that we make sure that they get feedback and there's a follow up and then you know they're encouraged to apply for future applications so i think that that can help um there is and i think also you know training um um selection panels to be a little bit more um circumspect about when they see uh text that's written there's a very good book called uh, why do so many incompetent men become leaders and um which written by somebody from ucl uh, it's a very good read uh, and the basic thesis is that um, when we select for senior managers and uh, and, and whatnot uh, we find it very difficult to distinguish confidence from competence and i think we obviously need to work a little bit harder um, at that and actually, we were looking at our own recruitment data uh, uh, earlier this week because we're gearing up for a Athena Swan application. But we're looking at um, our recruitment data, so it's, um, applicants um, shortlisted and then appointed uh, by gender. And we saw that um, uh, our shortlist tends to have an increased proportion of women than our applicant pool. And I sort of, we had a discussion about it. I was saying, okay, is this, is this, you know, if this was the other way around, we'd be saying this is bias against women. So is this bias in favor of women, uh, which I don't think is operating, but I think what it suggests is that uh, women are more careful about, about preparing and submitting their applications. More of the male applications were from people who were, you know, trying it on a little bit. And fortunately it looks like our process is able to, to sift through that. Um, and so I think being able to provide that reassurance that your selection process is robust. Maybe you know share the statistics and show that you know you are able to uh, um, select and appoint uh, in a in a proper way. It, 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 interestingly and troublingly, we don't see that issue when it comes to um, minority ethnic uh, ethnic minority applicants. So there, we have detected that there is bias in the um, shortlisting process, and so we are. Uh, working with our recruitment teams to to address that so there are multi dimensions to it but uh yes it is it is a it, it is where i mean one other thing that one can do but one has to be careful about it is is to you know provide extra support and extra training uh for applicants good mentorship whatever but it's not about fixing the woman okay that's the that's not what i want i don't want to to suggest that that's where the problem lies because the problem is systemic as well okay um, on a somewhat um, related um, kind of thought, that there's a question here, and it's looking at, um, at promotions and hiring decisions, and it's from an anonymous attendee, but they're wondering how DORA can be used to comparatively measure excellence and okay. you know, how to objectively and fairly weight the differences uh, between alternative um research assessments all right okay an interesting question with my tongue in my cheek let me ask <laughs> this attendee what are the units that you measure excellence in okay no there's no answer to that question it's rhetorical it's the same thing when you look at university league tables what are the units okay there's no units there aren't even you know competence intervals whatever which is another issue it's you know it's quoted to three significant three significant figures only so that they can create a ranking they, they can't measure a university quality and you cannot you can't measure excellence okay um it's not a measurement and when one talks about metrics actually a word i prefer is to use indicators i think it's a slightly humbler term uh, the use of the word metric implies that you can measure it now you can count citations okay and and you can use the number of citations as an indicator it's not a metric because it's not really a metric of anything Okay, what does it measure? You know, how many times your paper has been has been cited? But there are many different reasons why a paper will accrue many many citations. Uh, famously, there was a a paper in Science from six or seven years ago which claimed to have discovered in uh, one of these toxic lakes in California uh, a bacteria that had a form of DNA um, um, that had arsenic rather than phosphorus in its DNA. And it was the biggest load of baloney you ever saw, but it was published by a NASA scientist in science. That paper has 500 citations. It's never been retracted, but it was debunked within 48 hours, you know, of publication. It was embarrassing to, to the, uh, to the, to the people, uh, to the people involved. So I, I think we have to be, 
realistically cannot measure excellence. And when we are judging even a piece of work or a grant application, we're making an evaluation. That evaluation is subjective. It cannot be otherwise. It cannot be objective uh, in a sense. You, you can measure simple things objectively, okay? Uh, you know, you, you can measure, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the quality of a football team more objectively than you can science, but that's football, wonderful game, but it's a one-dimensional activity, okay? And nobody has any arguments that if you score more goals, you, you get more points, okay? Nobody has any dispute about that. We can talk about finances and oil-rich uh, owners, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, scholarship research is a much more complex activity and the benefits, the qualities that emerge from it are uh, diverse. They include papers, they include uh, the experience and the training of um, postdocs and PhD students. It includes changes in policy, possibly, uh, you know, it might include saving lives, you know. So, uh, you know, there are so many different things that come out of it. And at the end of the day, you have to make a judgment. You, you have to make a decision but let's not kid ourselves that we can do that objectively. Let's be honest that it is subjective. Let's try and make it as bias-free as possible by making sure everybody's aware of the possible influences of bias. And at the end of the day, you're taking a risk. You're taking a gamble. It may be that you pick, you back the wrong horse, okay? Uh, and uh, and you, you probably will never know. But that's the nature of our, you know, we do not have infinite knowledge. We don't know anything about the future. And I think we have to be humble about that. And, and the idea that there's some platonic ideal solution out there to research assessment is, is a fiction, I think. Um, we have just maybe one more question uh, that we can maybe uh, squeeze in before we, uh, we, we close out. But um, how do you see the challenges of this approach for basic science? When, when the impact may not be immediately apparent or even known? Um, so I think, um, I mean, that is, that is a good question. And one that the scientific community worries about a lot. And it's one uh, when I was involved in a campaigning group in 2010 uh, called Science is Vital in the UK, uh, arguing up against threatened cuts to the science budget. We did make a very powerful argument about, you know, it really is important to fund basic science. In the UK, I would have to say, um, 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 there is a relatively mature um, attitude towards, you know, having a balance between basic science and then more applied science. And certainly there is, I think, plenty of space for funding basic science. It's very, it has very strong public support. So there are, there are public opinion polls done every two years. And it's something like 83% of the public are happy for scientists to work on something that doesn't have any immediate application. And I think our politicians understand that, you know, even people like George Osborne used to get it for all his flaws as a, as a, as a, as a chancellor, certainly David Willits did when he was university's minister, but you don't necessarily always have people of that caliber in those roles. I think the argument can be, you just have to look at history at all the really good things that have arisen from serendipitous or from curiosity driven uh, uh, research. And actually there's a fascinating story around the development of the Pfizer, the mRNA vaccines, you know, that's that, you know, that, that was produced uh, at a tremendous rate, but actually there's 20, 30 years of research behind that, uh, that happened uh, where people were researching it and, you know, uh, where it was, you know, was funded or not funded. And uh, uh, famously that one of the, I can't remember her name, uh, but in order to advance the research, she was passed over for promotion and she went and worked somewhere else so that she could, you know, follow up the, the RNA, RNA research. And so there are many developments that arose because of, you know, fundamental research. And I think it's, I think it's easy to make those cases. In, in some ways, you know, the, the REF exercise in the UK, the Research Excellence Framework, so that now has a component. So 25% of your, the score that your departments get is on the impact of your research. And the way that they, they don't measure the impact, but the way that they evaluate it is that they ask you to produce a case study. Uh, so based on, you know, based on a paper that you published within the last 15 years, tell us about an impact that it's had outside the academy in the real world. And it could be, you know, a new company, a new invention, a new policy or, or, or whatever. And uh, for every eight members of staff or 10 members of staff, you have to produce one impact case study. It caused a, a lot of consternation when it was first introduced, but actually it, it's produced a, 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 a treasure trove of you know, stories and examples of you know, unexpected benefits that came out of research. And that 
uh, plays really well with our, our elected representatives, okay? I know that the plural of anecdote is not data, but don't underestimate, and I'm sure this must play very well in Ireland of all places where you know, people love stories and are great storytellers. Uh, you know, great stories have great political impact uh, with, with politicians, many more, much more so sometimes than metrics or, or a bunch of you know, charts and figures. Uh, and so I don't, you know, I, I think uh, it, it's not universally true. I think in Australia, there's a much stronger push from the government to only fund stuff that has a, a, a predicted outcome. And I think that's extremely dangerous because you cannot predict outcomes, you know. And clearly there are issues where you want to throw a lot of money at a particular problem and try and solve it. But I think you want to be very open about, you know, the, the research and the approaches that you will that you will fund in order to do that. And actually the ERC is, is pretty good at that because they very much have a re remit for, you know, high quality, risky research. Uh, and I think uh, they're, uh, you know, they do a good job of, 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 of supporting that. And I think it's an easy sell to the, to the, to the country, while at the same time recognizing that um, in, a, in a society where a lot of research is publicly funded, it is really important that that lands with, uh, you know, and that people understand how it impacts their lives. That was, I think, one of the, one of the things I realized with Brexit was that, you know, so Britain historically, <laughs> did extremely well out of EU funding mechanisms. We got back more money than we put in, used to. Um, but people, you know, in Middlesbrough or whatever, they didn't really see that any of that impacted their lives. And there wasn't a good resource that showed, you know, these, you know, we have this now because of, you know, EU funding or because we collaborated more easily with our European partners and that produced it. And, and so having those case studies and stories is really, really important. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think we're we probably reached the end of our uh, our time for the seminar. So um, thank you very much again, uh, Stephen, for making the time to for that really excellent um, webinar and presentation. And, and thanks very much for answering all our questions that came in as well. I'd like to say thanks too to um, to my colleague David, who organised the session as well, and for our seminar series this year. And also, uh, finally, I'd like to thank everybody who came along today as well and uh, participated and listened. And hopefully, you know, together we can we can learn how to how, how to how to do research assessment and and, and impact in, in a more responsible way. So thanks everybody for coming along today. Thank you, and good luck to UCD in your uh, reforming your research assessment. So. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye.